Hello, Guy. Are you still with us? I am. Thank you. That that's good. That's good. Okay. Well, um, as I told you before, like the your curriculum vitae is so long that uh, it is perhaps longer than many books I've read. So I will just read. Uh... <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to come and speak to your group. Uh, my apologies. I have two apologies. One, I'm sorry that I don't speak any Spanish, so that's bad on me. The second one is I apologize in advance should I uh, make any faux pas, any cultural inappropriate comments because I'm just an ignorant gringo. Um, let's see, so I'm going to uh, show my screen here. And I'm gonna assume that you can all see this now. So again, the, the title is Analysis of Performance and it's knowledge and skill enablers. So I'm going to provide a little bit of a background and then we'll do some questions and answers. And then I will get into the heart of what we're gonna talk about, which is the analysis of performance and then do some questions and answers. And then we'll talk about analysis of knowledge and skills. And then we'll do some more questions and answers. And then I've got some references, some some books that I've written that might be of interest to you and some free resources. And I'll share those with you and, we, and then we can, uh, whatever time remains, we can uh, have some additional uh, questions and I'll try and answer those if I might. Um, this graphic on the, on the right-hand side of the screen is my definition of performance. And, and I use this phrase performance competence because back in 1979, I was trained on the methodologies of two people in particular, the late Gary Rumler and the late Tom Gilbert. And Tom Gilbert had written a book called uh, Human Competence in 1978. And that's why I use the term competence. It could be known as capabilities. It could have many different terms, but, but that's my focus is on performance in the workplace which I define as you can read there, the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. Nobody is on the payroll to, to behave a certain way or just to perform tasks. All of those are a means to the ends of performance, of producing outputs, which are inputs to customers, internal customers or external customers. So we, we are in the business of providing learning and development or training and development to people so that they can do a better job of performing their tasks to produce outputs. And they all, both the tasks and the outputs must meet stakeholder requirements, the customer's requirements, regulatory agencies, the owners of the company, the communities that we operate in, et cetera. I'm going to slow down and take a pause every once in a while so that the translator can try and catch up to me. I don't know how it is for you uh, in South America and in Peru, but there's a lot of conversation yeah. on social media of L&D professionals uh, who suggest that we shouldn't be order takers, that we should push back, we should challenge the requestor whether or not there's a training need. I think that's misguided. Back in 1985, one of uh, the influential gurus of the day uh, pushed back on the people who are suggesting that we should push back. And this is my saying here about all of that. Training requests for new hires, we should expect. But if a client comes to us with a request to address a performance problem, we should suspect that request. But we should honor the requester and the request and begin our efforts because we shouldn't be pushing back or challenging people before we have any data. 
So I believe that we should take our clients on the journey through an analysis and let the analysis data inform the client's decision-making about whether to continue to develop instruction or learning or whether to pivot to some other non-instructional intervention. Am I going too fast? No, so far is, is good, Guy. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I have to pause for that. So this is another one of my models. This on the bottom left there, it says adapted from the Ishikawa diagram, which was uh, created in the 1950s in Japan as part of their quality movement. Um, and it was similar to what this looks like. But there was also this Tom Gilbert, who I've already mentioned. In his book, he talked about a behavior engineering model and the variables regarding performance. There's human variables and there's environmental variables. Well, my model here is in three parts. The first thing that we need to understand is the process itself. Is there one? If there is, are people adhering to it? Because if we've got performance problems, maybe that's where we should start looking, the process itself. If we have new hires to train, they need to learn how to perform in the process. On the right-hand side, there's two types of enablers, and we'll come back to this later, but there's human enablers, and you can read them there. Those are the, that's how I look at the human as they perform in the process. And there's environmental enablers, what sometimes is called infrastructure. These are the things that the humans use in the process to produce outputs. We, of course, because we're involved in learning and development, we're concerned with the awareness, knowledge, and skills that people need to have on the job. Sometimes they just need a little bit of awareness. Sometimes they need deeper knowledge. And other times they need skills, the ability to do things rather than just know things. So that's what how the learning and development function fits into this model because that's what they need to be concerned with primarily. And it's all driven by the process. How, how else can we determine what do you need to know or be able to do unless we understand the performance context, the process or processes? Now, over the past four decades, processes have been known as work streams, and they are more currently today known as workflows, but it's all the same thing. There's two types of tasks that people perform in processes. And we're, I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit, but I'm going to shift that model of the process to say the process are outputs, which are inputs to the next step where behaviors and cognitive tasks are performed to produce the next output, which is an input downstream as the graphic is trying to display. When we try to develop performance-based training or instruction or learning, training and learning and instruction that helps people perform, we need to understand what the outputs and the tasks are. That's the first thing we need to focus on is what are the outputs that people are supposed to be producing and then what tasks must do they perform in order to produce those outputs. And we have to be very careful about tasks because there are two types. There's the overt behavioral tasks, people doing things. We can observe those. We can count and measure those. But then there's the cognitive tasks, which are covert, the thinking tasks. We can't see what people are thinking. And if we don't teach our learners how to think about their performance, how to think about their behavioral tasks, then our instruction, our learning will be incomplete. The research shows that experts and everybody, you and me, 70% of what we use to make a decision 
is what's known as non-conscious knowledge. I can't tell you. You can, I can try to tell you, I can know about this issue of 70% is non-conscious, but I will not be able to recall it and share it with you. When we work with subject matter experts or master performers, they're suffering from the same issue. They cannot tell us everything that they think about in order to make a decision, in order to make a discrimination, in order to know what to do next. The research also shows that regarding the behavioral tasks that we can all observe, they can they will forget or they will not be able to recall 40% of those. So they can only share 60% of the behavioral tasks when they tell us what they do, step one, step two, step three, step four, they'll be missing 60, uh, 40%. When they tell us about how they make decisions in those steps, they'll be missing 70%. The good news is that another expert knows a different 60% and 30%. So it behooves us when we're doing analysis of the tasks that are need to be performed that we talk to more than one SME, subject matter expert. Hablamos it's, con, con más de un experto en la materia porque muchos de los, de los conocimientos son inconscientes y no, son, no están al alcance de nosotros. Y eso es importante para crear eh, aprendizajes. There are methods for doing the cognitive task analysis that is called cognitive task analysis. And there's research that's been done on this for the past 25, 30 years. So before we launch into my approach to doing performance analysis, do you have any questions for me about what I've covered so far? Please feel free, everyone, to put them in the chat uh, in Spanish also. Don't worry about the translation. That's our job. If there is, isn't anything right now, I can go on and then we yeah. can, we'll have two more of these, so. Exactly. Yeah, we don't have anything in the chat so far, so okay. I'll guy go on. Maybe I'm going slow enough it makes sense. I don't know. All right. So when I do performance analysis, when I get a project uh, and I start it um, after I've got a project plan put in place and have reviewed that and have my client identify my sources for my analysis data, I, I, I look at the performance first. And if I'm looking at something that's large, like an entire job, this one is for a made up company, TMC, and it's for a salesperson, the sales rep, as we call them. And so I'm going to then look at their performance and break it into chunks, chunks that I call areas of performance. These are also known over the decades as major duties or key results areas or accomplishments. It's, it's simply a work breakdown structure where you take a system and you break it into component parts. That's all I'm trying to do so that I can begin to analyze each piece. And of course, the chunks need to be logical. There needs to be some reason as to why you, why you break it down a certain way. But this is my example here. So a salesperson might be doing territory planning, figuring out how they're gonna go across their territory, Maybe they're going across all of Peru and they, they don't want to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. They want to go to one part of Peru, another part, and do something in a logical way and you know, save some uh, uh, gasoline uh, and uh, mileage expense. But um, the second part is that for each one of the chunks, we would produce what I call a performance model. And this example is for territory planning. Now, my training assignment could have been develop training on, on territory planning, and then I wouldn't be looking at the rest of the job. But if I'm looking at the whole job, I'm breaking it down so that I can look at each part and begin to understand. So if territory planning is one part of the job, what are the outputs? What are the tasks? 
et cetera. And this is my format that I learned back at, it, it, the format was different because back in 1979, we didn't have computers, we had typewriters, and the people that typed it up had to create something that looked like this chart on the right, which is uh, clunky and hard to do. So we're gonna look at this in a larger sense now. So these again are known as major duties and key results areas and accomplishments and many different names for them. I just call them areas of performance because sometimes these other labels had nuanced meanings for the people that I was working with and, and that got in my way. So I just made up a, a new phrase for it. Uh, you should call it whatever makes sense when you do this kind of work in, in your company or whoever you're working with. So again, if we're looking at territory planning, we would look at, so what's the performance when we interview people in a group or one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two -on -two or three people, small group interviews, we wanna understand first, what are the outputs? And this chart captures things and says, part of the data on this one page is going to identify ideal performance, performance that's future state, better than anybody's doing right now, or it's what our best people are doing right now. And we would like everybody else to perform at the levels of our best people. The right-hand side of the chart identifies the gap performance data. So the, we're gonna come back to these questions later on, but I have a set of questions that I ask to identify the ideal performance. When I train people on these methods, I tell them, these are my questions and you can't use them. My, my thinking is that you, me, everybody needs to know how to ask these questions more than one way. So you just can't use my questions when I'm training you. You must create your own set of questions that gets at the same data. Different questions slightly worded differently is what I'm trying to train people to do so that they don't try to ask the same question the same way five times in a row, hoping that they're gonna get a different answer. You must flex your questions to whoever you're asking. And so that's my intent. So I have a set of questions for ideal performance and I have a set of questions for the gap performance. Now I've shared with you two PDFs of the handouts and the presentation that I'm using right now, that's one of your handout, uh, handouts as well. There was three items. So you can go back at this and look at this uh, later on and look at these questions. And of course you can use my questions, but you should also know, have other ways to ask the very same question, paraphrasing my questions. So the first set of questions that I have are going after the ideal performance. And we wanna know, first thing we want to know is when you're doing territory planning, as an example, what are the outputs? And it might be, well, there's a territory plan, and that might make sense. And then we want to know, well, how do you measure it? How do you know a good territory plan from a bad ter territory plan? And these are just some examples, and it's not complete. This is based on work that I did back in 1986, and I've been using this as an example since then, because a lot of people can relate to salespeople that travel across their territory to call on different customers and different prospects. So that's what a territory plan is all about. And, and, and so that's just the idea there. Now, sometimes there's more than one output. There's an interim output. If we're gonna produce analysis data, as an example, we might create an interview guide, our questions. Then we're gonna conduct the interviews and create the data, the answers to those questions. And then we might put all of that into an analysis report. So we just can't worry about the final output. Sometimes we have to look at what the interim outputs are. And I've simplified this example here uh, when I first talked to people about it, but I don't want them to think that there's only one output per area of performance. Usually there's more than one. The next thing I wanna know is now that I understand what that output is, I can ask what are the tasks that are performed to produce that output? And then I can write down and capture what people tell me. And again, 
this this is just an example here. It may not be quite complete, but the idea is for every output, there's a set of tasks that are performed. Normally, what I capture when I'm doing this are the behavioral tasks and not the cognitive tasks. And depending on how I've organize my project, I might need to use these behavioral tasks to ask about the cognitive tasks and then add that into this column of data. So it depends on the project, but the goal here is understand the output, understand the tasks. And the next thing is to understand is who does what? What are the various roles? Now at the bottom of this chart, it said there's four roles. There's the sales rep, sales support, sales managers, and the sales vice president. So we want to understand when, when these tasks are being performed, is the salesperson doing all of them? Well, yes. Is anybody else involved? Well, yeah. The sales manager might be involved in that review with the sales manager task. And so now we have some role clarity about who is doing what. And so that when we train people, we can say, here's what you're doing. And oh, by the way, when you're, you will need to do a review with the sales manager for that last task in my simple example here. So the next thing to do is that once we've identified, well, this is ideal performance. This is what we want to train new people to do. Um, and, or, or if there's problems, we want to use this data to find out, well, where are the problems and so we want to understand, well, what are the typical performance gaps? And what I always do is look at the measures and say, is the plan always accurate? Always accurate. Is it always complete? Does it always have a territory map and a customer matrix and a prospect matrix? Is it updated quarterly? Well, then the people can tell me, well, the, here's the typical gaps. Typical gaps happens all the time, not once in a blue moon or every 37 years. The plan is incomplete or not updated quarterly when needed. That's a typical problem, my sources have told me. So I don't do this job for a living. So I'm capturing what they tell me and putting it in my chart. And they also said that the plan is not adhered to when they're doing account planning. So I've captured that as well. The next thing I want to understand is the probable gap causes. Why is this happening? And I'm asking the people who have given me the information, they've told me that these are the two gaps, and I'm asking them, well, why is it? Now, just because they tell me doesn't make it true, but you have to ask somebody and you have to start. That's why I call this column probable gap causes instead of root gap causes, because I'm not spending all the time in the world that it would take to determine that this is truly the root cause. I'm just getting the information and collecting it from my sources. So they might tell me, here's some of the causes. The number one there is they don't know how, they don't take the time. Well, what I want to then work with is understand, get everybody to agree that what's, what, what type of cause is that? The don't know is what I call a deficiency of knowledge. We can handle that with training. We can fix that one with learning, but they don't take the time to do it. Training is not going to solve that. Learning is not going to solve that. That's a management issue to manage their people better because training is not going to save them from that gap. All right, so again, these are examples. So what, I, what, what is typical when I do this kind of analysis is that there's more deficiencies. You can see the deficiencies down here in the bottom. There's the deficiency of the process. We don't have one or the process is no good. Or we have a deficiency of the environmental supports. That's the, that's the cause of the problem. Or the people don't know. They have a deficiency of knowledge and skill. Ah, training, learning, instruction can address that. But there could be an a deficiency of the individual attributes and values. I, I see I spelled values wrong, excuse me. Um, so if, I, if the job were to load 50 pound bags into a truck all day long, 
I might be exhausted after one hour and can't do the whole eight hour shift. There's a physical requirement there. Maybe the physical requirement is eyesight or hearing or taste, depending on what the job is. So there's sometimes these other issues that training is not going to resolve. And when I'm doing this analysis, I don't push back on the client's request. I do the analysis and the, let the analysis data inform the client's decision making. If my client thought that they were going to fix territory planning with instruction, this data says, no, you're not. So you might have to have some instruction for the people who don't know how, but these DEs are not going to be solved by learning. When I gather this kind of data, I since 1979, I try, I try to work with a team of master performers so that I have them collected. And then I have a flip chart at the front of the room and I collect this data right in front of them and they can see what I'm collecting. They can see what I'm writing down. They can correct me if they don't think I got it quite right. Sometimes two or three people talk at the same time. I try to write down what I think they said and they get to see it so they can correct it and fix it. I need my sources, my master performers, I need them to own this data. I'm just the facilitator who collects it and writes it down. I don't own this data. I, it's not mine. It's the sources that I use. <coughs> so this is the ideal performance. Ideally, master performers that do the job to a level of mastery, this is what they do. Here's what the non-master performers are struggling with and why. Again, these are the two sets of questions for the ideal performance and then the data for the gap performance. And these are the questions that I ask to try to determine, do we have typical performance gaps? Are they caused by this or by, by the process, by the environment, by the knowledge and skill, or the individual attributes and values? These are the individual attributes and values of people. They either have awareness, knowledge, and skills that are sufficient to what the process requires. They have the physical attributes. They have the psychological attributes, intellectual attributes, and personal values. And they need to be able to use the environmental enablers, data and information, materials and supplies, tools and equipment, the facilities, and, and the grounds of the where they work. There's budget and headcount issues, and then there's culture and consequence issues. Sometimes the culture is not right, and it doesn't, it reinforces the wrong things and extinguishes what we want. An example of that is we often give the best workers more work than anybody else. And then they get smart and figure that out and they slow down so they're not being overloaded with work unfairly. These performance model charts are capturing what the process is. And then we can then derive, systematically derive these enablers. If we're looking at training, we only concern ourselves with the awareness, knowledge, and skills necessary to do that. And we're gonna cover that next. So does anybody have any questions for me? Yes, we have, we have one question, Guy. Um, so Janet asks, how can we help the, the, the expert, or in this case, the master performance, to distinguish between key tasks, you know, those that produce uh, results, uh, from those that are not that important, that are, are I mean, in Spanish, we say operativos, operative uh, tasks. You know? how, how can we make them distinguish or at least prioritize those? Well, so either a task is necessary to produce an output or it's not. Now there are what I would call macro level tasks, the big task, conduct analysis, and that's it. And when you're done, you have the analysis data. Um, a more mid-level task might be create an interview guide, conduct the interviews, uh, write the analysis report up, 
That's a mid-level of the macro task. The micro task might be study good interview questions, draft your, your interview questions, review them with your boss or your peers, then finalize them, then schedule the interviews, conduct the interviews, write them up, review the, what you wrote up with the people you interviewed and give them a chance to you know, fix any errors, and then write up the analysis report draft, review that with your boss, then finalize it. So there's, a, there's different layers of tasks. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I work with a group, then they, they uh, control that. They might say, guy, that's not a task that's necessary. You know, got, you know take it off the list, facilitator. Um, uh, so that's why I prefer working with groups because they correct things. They fill in the gaps because they each non-consciously know a different amount of the of what I'm trying to capture. One person can give me 30%. Another person knows a different 30% and they can add to what the first person says. And that's much easier when we're all in the room together for me to capture this and put this on a flip chart. If I'm doing individual interviews, it just is a much longer process to do that. But, but the test is really, if somebody gives me a task, where in the task flow does it fit? And is it truly necessary? Um, a lot of the people in the total quality management movement have been spending most of their life trying to lean a process take out all the unnecessary tasks and steps. How do we configure the process to be as effective and efficient as possible? So uh, I don't normally struggle with people uh, giving me tasks that aren't necessary. Uh, what my issue normally is, is that I get big macro tasks and then a micro task and then another micro task and then a big macro task and then a micro task and another micro task and I don't know that that's what I've got, big tasks and little tasks all mixed together. So it's very uneven mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when somebody else comes along and reviews it. Um, but I never let that bother me because what I normally capture on the performance model charts is usually sufficient for me to use that data to generate the knowledge and skills that are required. Okay, thanks. We don't have any more questions, so we can. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So again, we're we're looking at the process and we're determining what the knowledge and skills are, and and we're using these other enablers to find out. Well, if there are gaps, is the gap in any of these environmental enablers? What about the physical, psychological, intellectual, personal values that people have? It may not be about knowledge and skill. It might be that guy can't do an eight-hour shift lifting heavy bags and loading them into a truck. He's, he's worn out after an hour, and the shift is eight hours long. So we need to hire people that are stronger than guy and because that's what the job requires. Same thing psychologically. Uh, salespeople that can't take rejection don't last very long in the job because in sales, there's a lot of rejection. You don't make a sale with every sales call that you make. You, so, so these are the kinds of things that the recruiting and selection system needs to address. And these other environmental enablers are other parts of management in an enterprise that need to help us address that. We in learning development can only address the knowledge and skills. And sometimes we're asked to solve problems when that's not in our purview. That's not part of what we own or do for our clients. So again, we can generate these performance model charts. Maybe it's only territory planning. Maybe we're looking at the whole job and we have a lot of data and we need to figure out what are the awareness, knowledge, and skills. So what I use is a set of knowledge and skill categories to systematically derive these enablers of knowledge and skills. And so these are my categories. And so I use this data. And if I was looking at territory planning alone, I would ask, well, what are the company policies and procedures and practices and guidelines that somebody needs to know 
when they're doing territory planning? And I would get an answer and I would write all that down. Then I would ask, well, what are the laws, regulations, and codes? So these are internal rules. And the next category is external rules. And there might be additional rules like industry standards that we adhere to. So those aren't laws, those are just industry standards where we all kind of agree on what's, what does the electrical plug look like that we put into the wall? You know, everybody can't have their own because then it wouldn't work everywhere. So these are the various categories. I'm gonna show you an example on this next page here. So we're gonna look at marketplace knowledge for territory planning. So again, I've got on the left, my performance model chart of data. I've got the ideal performance and the gap performance. And now I'm looking at the category of marketplace knowledge. So theoretically, I would have already done categories one through five, because this is category six. And then I'm going to be looking at territory planning, which is this column here. And so I would have asked, what marketplace knowledge do you need to have when you're doing territory planning? And if I was sitting there in a room with a group of experts, they might have given me this list. And again, you don't need to look at the specifics of the list. This is just the idea. We can systematically derive this list by asking marketplace knowledge, territory planning, what do you got to know? And that's how we generate this list. So if my assignment was to do training, uh, learning on territory planning alone, I would be done with this category. If I had to look at account planning and planning to do sales calls, et cetera, the rest of these areas of performance, I'd have to go to another performance model chart, ask the same questions and write things down in, in column B. Maybe knowing the competitors is needed in B as well and in C. Uh, maybe exclusive products are not needed in B, but are needed in C. And so I build up a matrix here eventually of this, but I've tried to keep this example simple. On the right-hand side here is additional data for every one of these line items. I can ask, well, do we hire people that already know these things? or do we have to train them? And the default is usually training because you don't often hire somebody who knows everything that they need to know. If they came from a competitor, maybe. But, it, but and, and if we only hire from competitors, well, this would be select. We already select people who know these things. We don't need to train them. So this is the first set of data that I try to get. Because if we select for it, then I don't need the rest of this data. And I can skip it. So my next question is, how critical are these knowledge and skill items to my ability to be a master performer? How critical, high, medium, or low? How difficult is it on average, how typically, for people to learn this, high, medium, or low? Some things are low, they're easy to learn. Some things are medium to learn. Some things are high. How volatile is this content? I want to know this data so that when I go package my content, when I develop it, I'm not going to take volatile content that's medium and put it in a video because that's costly to update all the time. Uh, this, this content that's low volatility, well, I can put that in uh, video or augmented reality or virtual reality because it's not going to change very much. And when I create it, it's going to be good for a long time. If there was an item that was high on this list, Entonces, ¿qué tan cambiante es esto? Es, es, esto es muy cambiante. Tengo la conciencia de, de lo que estoy haciendo. Si este contenido, este contenido está reduciendo mi, mi ciclo de vida. Entonces, and then I asked this question here of the group. What will that grupo. ¿Qué profundidad de, en la instrucción? Necesitan tener un poco de conocimiento, conocimiento muy profundo, o deben tener cierta habilidad que alguien necesita tener. Hay, por ejemplo, alianzas. Hay 
<coughs> this is the kind of data that I review with my clients and say, when we create instruction or learning, it's going to be how to do produce those outputs to those that, yo voy a producir esas medidas, esos resultados por hacer estas tareas y lidiando con estas brechas en el desempeño, con estas fallas. Skills that need to be part of that instruction. Are there any questions here? Because we're getting within 10 minutes of our stop time. Yeah, I mean, we got uh, a couple of questions, but I was thinking that because we are only having translation until eight o'clock here and 9 p.m. for you, maybe we can finish the presentation is if, if that's okay for you. And then at sure. the end, as, as you are gently staying with us, maybe we can then ask you the questions. That's fine. Okay. Um, so the All I've got, got here is that now I've, it says I've written 28 books, but I've actually written 30. Um, since I created this presentation here, I'm, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm almost 70 years old, as you can tell by the gray beard, but not by the hair. Um, and so I, I'm semi-retired and I've spent a lot of time publishing, writing books and publishing them before I'm, you know, done with the, with the profession here, which might be another year or two. But so I've got a couple of, I've got a bunch of books, but these two are in particular covering what I presented here uh, tonight. Um, back in 2006, I, I have, uh, I published chapter 11 in this handbook of human performance technology with my professional organization, ISPI. I've been a member of the organization since 1979 when I got in the business. I've been on the board of directors. I've been the president of the organization, blah, blah, blah. But, but so it's a good organization for people who want to have a performance orientation to learning and development and non-instructional means of addressing performance issues. Uh, that's why I love the organization. So this, this uh, there's a free 25 page PDF on my website that is chapter 11. And so you can go get that. And that goes into much greater depth. So tonight I covered the awareness level. This would give you the knowledge level that goes much deeper, as an example. And that, that 2006 chapter uh, is kind of an update to what was published uh, in the Performance Improvement Journal of ISPI, which was NSPI back then, back in 1984. So again, I've been doing this for a long time, since 1979. The first article on these methods got published in 1984. The 2006 chapter, it goes into much greater detail. Uh, and, and if you're really interested in this, you can uh, read those two things. But then on my website, I have hundreds of resources. I've got over 600 videos that I've produced over the past 15 years. And I have a series of videos that walk people through methods like doing the performance analysis, the knowledge and skill analysis, et cetera. So that's kind of a wrap for this presentation. Thank you for inviting me. And I would like to invite everybody, if you have additional follow-up questions, if you go and look at the handouts later on and, and you, you come up with some questions, feel free to email me your questions and I'll respond. But thank you very much for having me uh, speak to your group today. Thank you, Guy, for being with us. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot clap. I mean, we can. Actually, we can clap. <laughs> no, let's do it. Like, probably you won't hear it, but uh, you can see it. Thank you. Uh, so, so we got a, a few questions. Um, and, and please, for everyone, feel free to, to, to put them on the chat. Feel free to do that in Spanish also. We can translate it for you. So one question Claudia asks, uh, what are the steps of uh, the macro process of um, ISD, which I think stands for uh, Instructional de uh, Systems Design, or if you can summarize the principal steps. Yeah, so I, so first of all there, I prefer the term Instructional Systems Design, which is looking at the system of instruction. Mm -hmm. Then there's also ID, Instructional Design, 
And uh, my interpretation, so the, the language that we've had in this profession has been changing since I first got into it. It used, it used to be that ID and ISD stood for Instructional Systems Development or Instructional Development. Then in the early 80s, it changed to, from development to design. Now we talk about learning experience design. It can be all the same thing, but, but we can't pretend that there is only one way to do this that people use. There are millions of different ways because there's millions of different people and everybody does it a little bit differently. But the answer to the question, I think, is that um, there's an ADDIE model. So there's a, now I've adapted the uh, ADDIE model and the ADDIE model stands for analysis, then design, then development, then implement, then evaluate, A-D-D-I-E. I, -D -D -I, -E. I uh, uh, adapted that uh, back in the early 80s as a consultant, and I put project planning and kickoff as my first phase. Then I do analysis, then I do design, then I do development, and then I do pilot testing. So pilot testing is usually a part of development in most people's models, but I pulled that out and made that a separate block, a separate area of performance, a separate major duty, because I wanted to emphasize that to my clients. I would say, we're gonna do analysis, design, we're gonna develop it, and then we're gonna pilot test it. And that means we're gonna do a full destructive test. We're gonna take our first drafts of the training and see if we can break it, see if we can find the problems and fix them before you start having everybody use that training or instruction or learning. Um, and so those are the major macro steps. And then after I do the pilot testing, I do revision and release. And as a consultant, I would do the revision updating after the pilot test session. And then I would release that content to my client and they would put it in their LMS or whatever system they use to deploy that. Um, if it's uh, e-learning, then it's going to be put in the LMS. If it's going to be a, a classroom, a face-to-face -face classroom, uh, then it's not going to be put into the LMS. It's going to have to, the materials have to go someplace else so that they can be used for deployments or, and for maintenance purposes. So that's my concept. So the ADDI model, the I and the E, the implement and evaluate, some people think that when you're done with your project, the client goes and implements it, and then somebody should evaluate that. Or uh, other people have talked about the I and the E, implement and evaluate, as being part of you develop it, you implement it, which could be the pilot test, and you evaluate it, which is what you do in a pilot test, and then you do continuous implementation, continuous evaluation throughout the life cycle of that product so that you can understand when does it need to be updated or when does it need to be archived or thrown away because things have changed and we don't need that anymore. Okay, thank you. Uh, we got another question. Uh, Alexandra asks, what should I consider in a work plan that consists of strengthening soft skills for a public with a fixed mindset? So soft skills, the hardest things to train on and hard skills are the easiest thing to train on. It's reverse. But so soft skills like interpersonal skills, verbal communications, written communications, there's a, a, a list of these, but they are all skills that you use in performance. So when you talk about something like verbal communications, you want to know, so where do people apply these in their job? Where do you use that? And so it's a mistake to just take something like verbal communications or written communications and not understand the performance context. What are the outputs and where are the tasks and where are you using verbal communications and where are you using um, a written communications? Because when you create instruction, you want it to be as authentic as the, as the people's jobs. So you don't want to teach verbal communications in a vacuum or disconnected from people's performance. If they're going to be conducting interviews and making presentations to their clients, 
That's when they use their verbal communications when they're doing interviews. So you need to practice verbal communications on interviews and making presentations because that's what they do in the job. If you didn't address, if you just talked about verbal communications and how wonderful it is and what it consists of and what, you know, but you never had people practice it, they won't internalize it. It won't transfer back to the job. And it certainly won't have an impact then to the business. So it'll be wasted efforts. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and Janet asks, um, so as instructional designers, normally uh, they, they, they look for us to produce courses in a, in a short time. So what, which recommendation can, can you give us to implement this, but to also be perform focused in a short time? And, and how long does it need to do the analysis? To do an analysis. Well, so I give my clients the option. I can do the analysis by you bringing together eight to 12 master performers, maybe four to six, it depends. And in three days, I'll be done with the analysis. If I have to go do individual interviews and observations and document reviews, well, that's going to take three weeks or three months. So it's a trade-off between going fast by bringing the right people together in the room and you can do this virtually and gather the data and have them say, oh, guy, you missed task in between your task three and four. Aren't there these other two steps? And it, either that's right. So But otherwise, you're going to one person and then going to another. They tell you different things. The third person tells you different things again. And now you've got to reconcile that. You've got to determine, you know, some people call it a tomato. Some people call it a tomato. Is that the same thing or not? You don't know as the analyst because you don't do that job for a living. So this, these are our challenges. But we can go fast if we know what data we're trying to get. And if we know that we want the output and the measures and the tasks And then the knowledge and skills, we can go much quicker. We can fine tune our questions to ask a group or ask individuals. So we can go quick. We, the, since I got into the business, analysis paralysis is the thing that everybody wanted to avoid. But sometimes instruction, instructional analysts didn't know what they were looking for. So they asked a whole bunch of questions and got data that was never used. And clients eventually realized that, you know, Guy collected all this data and we didn't use any of it. We're not doing that again. And so they don't want you to do analysis. They just want you to get in there and create. So if, so I, my approach to this is that when there's high stakes, high risks, high rewards for the performance, <clears throat> our clients need to really let us do an, an adequate analysis quickly, but we need to do it adequately. If it's medium stakes or low stakes, low risk, low reward, who cares? Well, then maybe we should just go ahead and do it and be done with it and be a team player instead of resisting this. So there's a time and a place to really almost insist on doing the analysis. In the past, when clients didn't want me to do analysis and just wanted me to create the content, I proved in the pilot test that the content was incomplete, inaccurate, inappropriate. And then we had to go and do it again and fix it so that it would be accurate, complete, and appropriate. And the client the next time let me do analysis so we wouldn't have to go do it twice. Okay. Uh, I have one question and... and First of all, thank you very much for staying with us. I know it's also later there in, uh, in the U.S. Um, so Shirley is saying goodbye. And thank you very much, Shirley, for the translation. Uh, so the next questions, I mean, feel free to do it in Spanish anyways, because I, uh, we can translate it. Um, I have one question. Why it's perhaps a bit philosophical. Why do you think L&D departments are always focused on doing like or I don't know, perhaps assuming that everything is caused by the lack of knowledge and skills. And, and, and perhaps that's why they are, um, oh, and we are, sorry, uh, order takers rather than, than performance analysts. And I don't think it's just the knowledge uh, of this model that you just explained for us. 
but it, there is, is there something else? Well, I think that, you know, so when we get a request, I, I just wrote a blog post about this and published it this morning, I think. Don't challenge a request, clarify the request, and then try to go do the analysis. A, a lot of times our clients have new hires that need to be trained. And if they don't have the training, well, then they need it. <laughs> um, and But sometimes they come to us and they have new hires that need training, but they say, I have a problem, you need to fix it. And we can investigate that problem and find out, well, this is what the job is, the outputs and tests, this is what you gotta know, here's the gaps of performance and there's other causes. Sometimes our clients don't have the power, the authority to go fix the non-knowledge uh, and skill issues. And then, so, that, so all they have is instruction or learning. And so they want us to create it to have, because they hope that we're going to have an impact. So what I, so this is where the analysis is even more important. When we're doing that gap analysis, we're asking master performers about these gaps because they generally always know why other people struggle and they know why they don't. Um, and what I ask them about is what are the barriers to performance? Those are the causes of the gaps. Well, I ask them, how do you anticipate those barriers and avoid them in the first place? And if the barriers were unavoidable, what do you do to recover as quickly as possible in the second place? And if we can't fix the root cause, bad equipment, bad data, the culture is wrong. If master performers are performing at a level of mastery, then it can be done. What we need to do is get their both explicit and tacit knowledge and package that and give that to the new people. So I don't believe in doing learning and development and generating content when it's really not going to solve the problem. And I've had major projects. I've had, I had a project for $700,000 that got canceled after the analysis effort. We didn't, I didn't do design. I didn't do development. I didn't do any of that stuff because the data, and I knew before I presented it to the clients that the smart thing to do would be to cancel the project because all of their problems were due to things that training was not going to fix. And as a consultant, I don't want to spend their money on something that's not going to work for them because that's going to reflect poorly on me soon, later, but soon. And so I was, I wanted them to look at the data and make the business decision to pivot away from learning and address these other issues. But most of the time, and I'm, you know, I'm a consultant, I'm working with big companies, and so they have big issues, high risks, and all that. But when I worked inside companies, I was working on smaller issues where the risks weren't so high, but, but the client needed to have this training put together specifically for the new hires. So we always said we would help them. We wouldn't push back. We would build the training for them, but we would also point to them these other issues and let them go handle them and try and fix them. But in the meantime, we had to tell the new people there are these problems out here and you're going to run into them and you need to know how to deal with them, how to avoid the problems in the first place. And if they're unavoidable, here's what you do. Here's the strategies and tactics of master performers who have already figured out this stuff. Mm -hmm. They can't fix it either, but they can minimize it. And so we can still add value. We can't make the world perfect, but we can add value for new people so they don't struggle as much, mm -hmm. so that they can become more successful more quickly. Okay. <coughs> Is there any other question? Um, and Guy, please feel free to say goodbye to us. Uh, we don't want to no, 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 no. give you with us I, until... I, I can stay. <laughs> you know, I love this. I've been doing it for so long, and, I, and, and I'm happy to work and stay and you know, talk with you and answer questions. We can talk philosophy. <laughs> I think it's a very a bit late to 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 <laughs> philosophy. <about that. laughs> Does anyone else have a question? 
Yeah, I have a question. Like, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's a correct question, but uh, is there a way that to make this uh, a fast track analysis? Um, or how long does it take to make a good analysis? Because normally um, the performance, the master performance don't have time and the company don't, don't want them to, to meet with us or just one minute, what, what meeting and not, not more. So how do you manage that? Is there a fast track, a, a fast way to, to make this analysis? Well, I, normally if the client gives me such an impossible situation, such, such constraints, I tell them that I'll do it, but it probably won't be very good. And if they want to spend their money to do that, then that's fine. When you're working inside a company, you can't say that. But when you're an external consultant, you can say that and say, you know, it's your choice. Um, but I appreciate the fact that people are very busy. And if we're not working on really high stakes, high risk, high reward, if because if that's the case, then I can usually convince the client, because what if you don't do this? What's the worst that could happen? Well, it could be pretty bad. Well, maybe then we should bring everybody together for three days and get this analysis done and do it right and have an impact, have content that transfers back to the job because it was authentic in the first place and it addresses performance so it'll improve performance. If that's what you wanna do, then this is how we get there. But if you're gonna give me one SME for one hour, I'm not gonna be able to do very much with that, but I'll do the best I can. If you're willing to live with that, then that's fine. I think that when you're a new person starting off and your client gives you these kinds of constraints, you need to let them know what the issues are, but that you're going to work on it. I used to tell my clients, okay, I'm going to salute you. I'm going to do it. Yes, sir. I'm going to do it. It's going to be a piece of garbage, but I'm going to do it for you. And they'll go, wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you mean it's going to be a piece of garbage? I go, well, I'm going to talk to one person. That's not sufficient, but I'll package what they tell me and we'll use it. We'll pretend it's any, it's good, but it won't be. But it's your call. It's it's your decision, and I'll go do it for you. And they and and I've had clients who said, "Yeah, go ahead." And it, it turned out to be true. It was garbage. The next time they listened to me, they said, "Well, what? Do we, how do we do this better than last time?" And I said, "Yeah, that was all my fault that last time. Not blaming them, taking the blame myself, even though it wasn't my, I wasn't to blame, but I took the blame." And I said, well, here's how we can do this. We can do this quickly, but there's two ways. We can use the group process where we bring the right people together and get this done quicker. Or I can go do individual interviews and I can observe people perform if necessary. That's not always necessary. And I can review documents that you already have that describe the process, that describe results or whatever. And, but that takes longer. But, it, you know, but it's easier to do because it's sometimes difficult to bring the right people together in a meeting to generate this kind of data. So I think it's a matter of working with your clients and building a trust relationship and, and doing their bidding, doing what they ask you to do, but letting them know politely that, you know, what the issues are that you see. So I always, I, I would actually do this. I would salute. I don't know if this means the same thing in, in Peru, but when we salute, that's, I was in the military, I was in the Navy. You salute somebody when you get an order and you're going to carry it out. I would do that and say, I'm going to do that, but it's going to be a piece of garbage, but I'm going to do it for you and I'm going to do it in a hurry. You know, let's get going. And eventually they trusted me to where they would ask me, how can we do this better? The last time it wasn't so good, but it wasn't maybe, you know, the worst thing, but but maybe they see that they can do something better. And so I can begin to work with them and build their trust. Now, I've got to be capable of doing that. I've got to have a good method and know how to use that method to get the best data out. It's all about the data. One way or another, I got to generate data about the outputs, the measures, the tasks, who's doing what, what are the gaps, and what are the knowledge and skills that one needs to do that? And when I use my charts, my performance model chart and my knowledge and skill matrix, as I showed you, they can look at that data and see, is that complete? And if my client can look at it and go, well, there's things missing, I'm going to go, well, tell me what they are and we'll put them in there. Because the people that you gave me, the one SME for one hour, 
we didn't get to it. So it's missing. Good. Let's let's fix the data and get it more accurate, more complete, and more appropriate for the instruction that we are trying to build. So I, there's no easy answer to this, but this is the issue that you raised is has been around since before I got in the business. So this is always a challenge. And I think it's, you know, our clients want to do a good job. They may or may not trust us. They may not trust our methodology. They may have seen, uh, when I worked at Motorola in 1981, I, 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 I got a request from a client I did my best active listening. I repeated everything that they said to me so that they knew that I heard them. And then I said, here's how we're going to do the analysis. And my client stopped me in a room full of 30 people. He stopped me and he said, Guy, we hate it when people like you come back 90 days later and tell us what we told you on day one. Now, they had had bad experience with people that do training. They had seen people waste 90 days and brought back data that was the same as they told them on day one. They didn't see any value add, so they were skeptical. What did I, what did I do in that instance? I said, well, let's start the analysis right now. So what are the parts of the job? And then we got those out, and there was 30 people in the room, so they all argued about it because they didn't have a consistent frame of reference. They didn't have, you know, they didn't see it the same way. And then we finally picked one piece. And I said, so what are the outputs that are produced by the supervisor? Because that's who they wanted to train. What does the supervisor produce when they're doing this part of the job? And we'll forget the rest. We'll get to that later. And they couldn't agree on it. But we finally got some things written down. And I said, how do you know a good one from a bad one? What are the measures? And they argued about that. And then I said, what are the tasks? And they argued about it and they said, we don't know what all the tasks are. And I said, well, that's why we would do analysis because how, how can we train people to produce those outputs if we don't know what the tasks are? But, but, but let's go ahead and say, so what are the gaps? What measures are typically missed? They knew some of those. Why are they, what's the cause? They didn't know. So I demonstrated to them what I would collect in the analysis phase. And as soon as I exhausted their knowledge, they begrudgingly gave me 30 days to go do it because they met every 30 days. And so I was to come back at their next meeting and show them the data I collected. So then I said, well, that's fine. I'll do that. Now tell me who I should talk to because they didn't want me to assemble a group. So I was going to go do interviews. I said, who's your best supervisors? We want everybody to be like them. Who are they? I need their time. And you're the people who can make that happen because if I call them up, they're going to they're going to say, I don't have time for you, guy. But if this is important to you, my client, then you're going to have to make that happen. You tell me who to go talk to. You tell me what data show up, and I will. So you, sometimes after you work with your clients, you have they have to see you as a team player, willing to work with them to be flexible. But I always tell them, I'm going to be flexible here, but I don't think it's going to work out so well. But I'll do it. I'll salute. And I because I, I think clients are they get too much pushback and I think that they want to know that you're going to help them do this and you can suggest to them better ways and they may not be willing to entertain that to allow you to do it that first time you talk with them about it but if you're developing a long-term relationship with them you can help them see that there are better ways to do this that there's that we want our our learning to be accurate we want it to be complete. We want it to be appropriate. And, and the part of the appropriate measure is it's authentic. We're teaching people how to do the job back on the job, not in some classroom or some e-learning program. We need to focus all of our content on the application to tasks and outputs. We gotta stop with just addressing topics. A lot of times I get a request for a topic uh, can you can you teach them about you know A B C or X Y Z? And I say, great, sure, I can do that. Can you tell me what the practice would look like? How would people practice A B C? And they go, oh, well, you know, the, it's a big target audience. Everybody applies it differently. I go, well, then that's what we got to cover because if we don't have people practice, we're wasting our time and effort and our money. We need people that we need to teach them about A B C, whatever that is. And, and have them practice how they would apply it in their real work. 
That is the secret, is to make sure we're always focused on those outputs and tasks. So we might have to create some content on ABC and then have different practice for this group, sales group, and then the finance group these, applies it differently. And then the merchandising or uh, marketing group applies it differently, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes I'll make clients, they will see the, the logic in that. But our clients and many of us are trapped in an education paradigm. We've all been to school. We know what that looks like. We all know that the teacher never told you, guy, this is what you're going to do out in the world of work. You're going to take this math and you're going to be doing this and this and this with it out there in the real world. They didn't know what I was going to be doing. And everybody in the classroom was going to be doing something differently. So they could just tell me about, you know, equations and multiplication and division and algebraic equations and things like that. But they didn't know what I was going to do with that. But they knew they were pretty sure I needed to know it. And we in enterprise or corporate training or in government agencies, we can look and see and start with what are people doing? What's the performance? And then we can say, if they're going to need, learn this topic, it's the topic and how to apply it in their workflow, work stream, process, tasks, whatever. So a, a lot of the issues are we get requests for topics and then we just address the topic and we have to fit it into a two hour module or a one hour module. And it's all arbitrary what gets kept in there and what doesn't. We can't say, do you really need to know that for using it in the workflow on the tasks? So the outputs and tasks, the performance is the anchor. We're always going to that. And I could say if there's A, B, C, A, yeah, you need that to perform the task. B, you need that to perform the task. C, you don't use that when you're applying the task. Maybe we don't need A, B, C, we need A and B. And clients will think about that and they might decide, yeah, that's right. It's a good thing we were focused on the terminal performance when we were looking at enabling knowledge and skills or enabling learning. Well, thank, thank you very much, Guy. That, that has been very insightful. And uh, yeah, uh, we, we don't want to keep you for, for longer. Um, also, you opened a, a door that I don't think is going to be fun for you, but you gave us your email. And I'm afraid... Uh, We will send you a lot of emails then. <laughs> that's, no, that's quite all right. I'm serious about that. Uh, okay. Since that time I retired and headed into retirement, my role in the profession is to help people develop themselves. And I was lucky at the very beginning of my career, I got this performance orientation. What I showed you tonight are things that I've been doing since 1979. Most of my peers in the business do not do that. And I think it differentiated me because I brought a performance orientation. My content was performance oriented. I had an impact to performance back on the job. And so my mission in life at this stage of my life is to help other people gain that performance orientation. I think it's critical. It's the only thing that makes ensures that we add value for the expenses that we incur. And our exactly. clients may not like it. It's different. But when they see it, when they see the what the results that they might get from it, then they'll be encouraged to do that, to, to use that as the approach. Yeah, so, yeah. John, bring on all the emails. Uh, <laughs> I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Once again, um, I, I would switch to Spanish just to say hello to the, to the audience. Um, muchas gracias a todos por participar. Hay, una, hay un link de, una, de la encuesta en el chat que Janet eh, colocó. Por favor, ayúdennos eh, llenando la encuesta para nosotros. Es muy importante. No solo para saber cómo nos fue en este café, sino para saber los temas de los cafés que vamos a hacer eh, en el futuro. Eh, nada, salvo que Janet, Chris, quieran comentar algo más. Eh, muchas gracias a todos por, por participar. Guy, once again, <laughs> thank you very much for, for being with us. Thank you for inviting me and uh, um, good luck to everybody in the future and uh, focus on the performance requirements and enable them 
and send me any emails that you have. You have the presentation, you have the handouts and somebody will send me the video, please. Yes, yes, we will. Uh, when we have it, we will edit it and then, then we'll send it to you. Uh, and for everyone, the, the handout that um, that guy is talking about, uh, we have it in the in the agenda, no? in the calendar agenda. No, Janet, and in case you don't have it, please feel free to ask it in the WhatsApp group that we have. Muchas gracias. Nos vemos. Gracias. Bye. Muchas gracias a todos por acompañarnos. Muchas gracias, Gary. Nos vemos muy pronto.